स्नेहे न बदनासी मनुस्मदीय दोषान शेषान सगुणी करोषी आहे तु नानो दयसे सदोषा स्वांके गृहीत्वा यदि दम विचित्र ओम शांति 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 बाइंडिंग आवर माइंड टू यू विथ द बॉन्स ऑफ योर लव ओ मदर शारदा यू ट्रांसफॉर्म आवर वर्स्ट क्वालिटीज इन टू वर्चूज योर कंपैशन इज सो बाउंडलेस दैट यू डोंट इवन कंसिडर वेदर वी आर वर्दी ऑफ इन यू टेक इवन अनवर्दी वंस इन टू योर ओन लैप ओ मदर Good morning everyone. And happy Mother's Day. I wish I could say I planned it this way but uh we'll call it a happy coincidence. Mother's will that I'm speaking on love on this very auspicious day. Cuz a mother's love is the highest love we know in this world. Swami Vivekananda talks about it a lot. The human mother is one of the highest manifestations of divine mother right we all need love in our life we need to love and we need to be loved the child when it's being raised by its parents needs to feel love from its parents if it doesn't what happens all sorts of problems later in life that child may need a therapist when it grows into an adult You have to see a therapist, work through trauma of not having a kind of loving upbringing. These things are very common. Parents also expect love from children, so it's not just one-sided. Romantic partners, spouses, loved ones, they expect love from each other. We expect love from our friends, from our guru. Gurus expect love from their disciples often. So lack of love leads to tremendous unhappiness in life we see that on a daily basis at the same time the term love has i think been cheapened through overuse it's ubiquitous and it's used all the time in all sorts of contexts i love you you love me i love this i love this dessert i love your outfit Most people tend to take the word love to mean just a strong degree of liking. It's on the same scale as liking, but just a stronger degree of liking. But that's not what true love is. That's one of the main themes of the talk today. When I was at Oxford as an undergraduate long back in 2000, I took a class on James Joyce's Ulysses, one of my favorite novels. It's the great Irish novelist James Joyce he wrote what's widely considered to be one of the greatest English novels ever written published in 1922 and there's a great line that's always stuck with me love loves to love love I'll read the passage here from chapter 10 the cyclops cyclops chapter of Ulysses love loves to love love nurse loves the new chemist Constable 14A loves Mary Kelly. Gertie McDowell loves the boy that has the bicycle. MB loves a fair gentleman. Jumbo the elephant loves Alice the elephant. Old Mr. Fershoil with the ear trumpet loves old Mrs. Fershoil with the turned in eye. The man in the brown mackintosh loves a lady who is dead. His Majesty the King loves Her Majesty the Queen. Mrs. Norman W. Tupper loves Officer Taylor. You love a certain person. and this person loves that other person because everybody loves somebody but god loves everybody this is from the novel ulysses so this last sentence is really important i think everybody loves somebody god alone seems to love everybody i think vedanta would agree with james joyce here Very few of us know what true love is. We talk about love a lot. But often that love is mixed up with selfish attachments, with egoism. 
Sri Ramakrishna would often distinguish between two Bengali terms, maya and daya. Maya he defined as selfish attachment, or you love somebody, but that love is based on selfish attachment to that person or that thing. I love my children because they're my children. I love my car because it's my car. I love my wife because she's my wife, and so on. By contrast, he said daya. Daya means compassion in Bengali, Indian languages. Daya, compassion, is loving everyone equally by seeing God in everyone. There's no partiality there. There's no selfishness there. There's no expectation of return. In the Gospel, this is an entry from April 8, 1883. Sri Ramakrishna himself gets a little irritated because he keeps hearing people talking about love, 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 specifically in the context of the Brahma Samaj. They talk a lot about love. He says, you talk glibly about prema. Prema is the term he uses for love. But is it such a commonplace thing? There are two characteristics of prema. First, it makes one forget the world. So intense is one's love of God that one becomes unconscious of outer things. Chaitanya had this ecstatic love. Second, one has no feeling of minus toward the body, toward your own body, which is so dear to human beings. One wholly gets rid of the feeling that the body is the soul. Sometimes Swami Vivekananda was asked what he felt about Sri Ramakrishna. And whenever people asked him about Sri Ramakrishna, he became dumb. He was very eloquent. He, he could speak on most occasions. But when asked about Sri Ramakrishna, he just, he got so emotional he couldn't speak usually. But one time he said, Sri Ramakrishna was L-O-V-E personified. Using the English, L-O-V-E personified. And in fact, in Bhakti Yoga, Swami Vivekananda defines God in the section called the philosophy of Ishvara in a very beautiful way. He, de he defines God as anirvachaniya prema swarupa. Anirvachaniya prema swarupa. God is of the essence of indescribable love. The Danish Christian philosopher, one of my favorite thinkers in the West, he wrote a, a wonderful book called Works of Love. The whole book is about love from a Christian standpoint. And he distinguishes again and again between true love and self-love. Self-love always has a taint of egoism and selfishness in it. So this really maps on nicely to Sri Ramakrishna's distinction between daya and maya. So in many cases, I think what Sri Ramakrishna's point is, is that when people talk about love, it's at least partly mixed with selfishness and egoism and a certain expectation of reciprocation of return. One of the most common mistakes that people make is to mistake lust for love, extremely common. Because it's so common, Swami Vivekananda, he often talked about it. And he has a kind of aphoristic statement about this. He says, lust is the death of love. Lust is the death of love. In his notes taken down in Madras, 1892 to three, he writes, Kama, lust, is blind and leads to hell. Prema is love, it leads to heaven. So there's a qualitative difference between lust and love, and yet people constantly confuse the two things. In the Katha Upanishad, there's a famous mantra, Shreyascha Preyascha Manushameta Sto Sambariti Vivinakti Dhiraha, Shreyo Hidiro Bipreyaso Vrinite, Preyo Mando Yoga Kshemad Vrinite. Two paths confront every human being. The path of Shreya, Shreya is the path of spiritual perfection, and the path of Preya the path of enjoyment, worldly enjoyment. And wise people choose, obviously, the path of shreya, of, of perfection, rather than the path of enjoyment. 
But Shankaracharya has a beautiful comment on this mantra. And he says, it's one thing to recognize these two paths and then choose consciously. I'm going to choose the path of enjoyment. That's not what most people do. He says, most people make a mistake before that. They can't even distinguish the two paths. And they, they, they mistake the path of prayer for the path of shreya. They think they're treading the path of spiritual perfection when all along they're actually path, uh, following the path of worldly enjoyment. This is the greatest danger. From the very beginning, we think we're walking merrily along on the right path, and in fact, we're going in the wrong direction. So the first step is to clearly distinguish, exercise viveka. The word viveka ananda means the bliss of discrimination. So he's constantly emphasizing this. Discriminate between true love and selfish attachment, love and lust, love and egoism. You have to be very ruthless with yourself. We'll get to that uh, later in the talk as well. So one way I would suggest of thinking about spiritual life in general is that it's a journey of learning how to love. It's not something we start out with. Love is an achievement. It's a very high spiritual achievement. That's something to keep in mind. Selfish attachments are easy. Liking people is easy. Loving people is one of the hardest things in the world. So as a spiritual aspirant, you should be asking yourself, often spiritual aspirants measure their progress in terms of how much time can I sit for meditation or prayer or whatever else? How many discourses do I attend like this one? That's all good. But the deeper measure of spiritual progress is, is my heart expanding? Is my heart expanding? But of course, today's talk is not just about love. It's about non-dual love. And for the remainder of the talk, I want to talk about non-dual love. You might think, some of you, especially who have some philosophical background, might think it's a contradiction. It's a paradox or a contradiction. You can't have love and non-duality at the same time. Why? So let me first explain why I think many people have a hard time reconciling non-duality with love. I think it's because they're used to one particular way of understanding non-duality, namely Shankara's non-dual school of philosophy, which is called Advaita Vedanta. The Sanskrit formula to capture his philosophy is Brahma Satyam Jagat Mithya Jivo Brahmaevana Paraha. Non-dual, impersonal, attributeless Brahman alone is real. Everything else, this entire world of names and forms, even the personal God, is an illusion. Jivo Brahmaevana Paraha. And each individual soul, in its deepest essence, is that non-dual, impersonal, attributeless Brahman. So how is this non-duality? It's non-duality because there's only one reality. What is that one reality? Brahman. But how does Shankara define Brahman? As the impersonal, non-dual, pure consciousness, which is our true nature. Even the fact that we're all sitting here, that you're sitting there and I'm talking to you here, even that's an illusion. <clears throat> there are no distinct individual souls at the end of the day. From the ultimate standpoint, there's only non-dual pure consciousness. If we accept that philosophy, <clears throat> it really is hard to ground or even make sense of the idea of non-dual love. Why? Because Shankara's philosophy teaches that all duality is an illusion. And love at least seems to imply a distinction between lover and beloved. Right? So love seems to entail duality. And yet from the highest standpoint, there's no duality. So not surprisingly, Shankara demotes the path of bhakti, the path of cultivating love for God, to a lower level. It's a preparatory discipline, along with karma yoga, the path of selfless action, to purify the mind and to concentrate the mind. So it's very good. He'll say it's great to practice bhakti but it can't take you all the way. Eventually, once you have a sufficiently pure mind and concentrated mind, stop your bhakti yoga. Why stop? 
because it perpetuates, it reinforces this illusion of duality. So no more praying to God, no more worshiping God. Stop bhakti, stop karma yoga, and focus exclusively on practicing jnana yoga, the path of knowledge, which alone leads to knowledge of your true nature as non-dual pure consciousness. So you see, it's because he does not accept the ultimate reality of shakti, of the personal God, that he ends up putting bhakti yoga, the yoga of devotion toward the personal God, on a lower footing. Okay? So now, that's just a little Shankara 101. Oh, and just, just to, uh, I'll just mention one more thing about Shankara here. In his commentary on Gita 6.5, he talks about love. He says, in fact, even a friend is an obstacle to liberation, he being the source of such bondages as love, etc. And the word for love here is sneha. Love is a bondage in Shankara's philosophy. Any feeling of love toward another person at the end of the day reinforces duality, your difference from that other person. So, seems to be a bit of a killjoy with respect to love. But, fortunately, Shankara does not have a monopoly on non-duality, on non-dualism. India boasts many different non-dual philosophies. We're just not aware of most of the other ones, unfortunately. And it's a great education to learn about other forms of non-duality, forms of non-duality distinct from Shankara's. What are some examples? Kashmiri Shaivism is a good example. Shakta Advaita is another one. And one of the main themes of my own academic work is to prove that Sri Ramakrishna's philosophy is another form of life-affirming, love-affirming, and ethically oriented non-dual philosophy. It's, a, it's, it's, it's definitely a non-dual philosophy, but it's one that affirms the importance and the highest value of love. So now I give you a bit of a primer on Sri Ramakrishna's philosophy. In my work, I call Sri Ramakrishna's philosophy Vigyana Vedanta. Because if you study his teachings, you'll find again and again that he talks about vijnana, this very, very high spiritual state of vijnana. He says that when one is trying to reach the roof of a house, you leave the steps behind one by one. And he likens this to the practice of neti neti, the reasoning, not this, not this. Brahman is not this world. Brahman is not this name and form. Brahman is not my body. Brahman is not my mind. Until you reach the roof. Reaching the roof signifies jnana, what he calls jnana. This is the spiritual realization of your true essence as non-dual Brahman in the state of nirvikalpa samadhi. This is the highest goal according to Shankara's school of Advaita Vedanta. But interestingly, strikingly, Sri Ramakrishna doesn't stop there. He says, but some people, after reaching the roof, then look back on the staircase and see, wait a minute, the stairs are made of the same material as the roof. Bricks, lime, and brick dust. He says the vigyani is the person who, after reaching the roof, after attaining knowledge of his or her true essence as non-dual Brahman, realizes that that same Brahman is equally shakti. The vigyani realizes jini nirgun tini shagun in Bangla. That reality, which is the nirguna Brahman of Advaita Vedanta of Shankara, is equally shakti, the personal God, Divine Mother who has become the 24 cosmic principles. This is the fundamental difference in outlook between the jnani and the vigyani. The jnani looks upon the world, if he or she comes back from the state of nirvikalpa samadhi, as a dream, as an illusion. Sri Ramakrishna would say, dhokar tati. It's a framework of illusion. The vigyani will look upon the world as majarkuti. It's a mansion of mirth, a mart of joy. Why? Because the Vigyani sees nothing but God. In all of these names and forms, the Vigyani sees nothing but God. So how can, how can the Vigyani help but rejoice? So the Sanskrit formula for Shankara's Advaita, as I said already, is Brahma Satyam Jagat Mithya. I've come up with a Sanskrit formula to characterize Sri Ramakrishna's Vigyana Vedanta. Brahma Shakti Satyam Jagat Satyam. So notice the first difference. Shankara's philosophy is Brahma Satyam. 
Sri Ramakrishna's Vigyana Vedanta says, Brahma Shakti Satyam, Brahma hyphen Shakti. The ultimate reality is not just Nirguna Brahman, it's equally Shakti, the personal God. First difference. Second, Shankara says, Jagat Mithya. Sri Ramakrishna says, Jagat Satyam. Swami Turiyanandaji, one of Sri Ramakrishna's greatest and most learned disciples, he is one of the few to have recognized this and articulated it. Toward the very end of his life, almost his last words, he said, Brahma shat, bra, he said in Bangla, Brahma Shutto, Jagat Shutto, Shabi Shutto, Shutte Pran Pratishtito. Brahman is true, this world is also true. Everything is true, everything is real. Life itself is grounded in truth. So he understood that. So keeping in mind Sri Ramakrishna's philosophy of Vigyana Vedanta, Brahma Shakti Satyam, Jagat Satyam. We can understand why Sri Ramakrishna put the Vigyani on a clearly higher footing than the Jnani. Again and again in the Gospel, he compares the two, Jnanis and Vigyanis, and the Jnanis don't fare well. Sometimes he'll say startling things. He'll say, Jnanis are selfish. Jnanis are selfish. They only care about their own liberation. Jnanis have attained what many great spiritual souls consider to be the highest spiritual realization. They've attained liberation. They're jivan muktas, liberated while living. They've attained knowledge of their true nature as non-dual Brahman. So just imagine from how high a spiritual standpoint Sri Ramakrishna must be speaking to say that jnanis are selfish. They don't have egoism. It's not selfishness in the sense of ordinary worldly egoism that we're all stuck with. This is a higher spiritual form of selfishness. They only care about their own liberation. He says, Gyanis are selfish. They're like a hollow piece of driftwood that sinks if even a bird sits on it. And he says, Vigyanis, like Narada, are like a huge log that not only can float across to the other shore, but can carry many animals and other creatures as well. So what's the difference? between the Jnani and the Vigyani, the fundamental difference, love. It's the greatness of heart of the Vigyani, that the Vigyani will choose to defer his or her own liberation to help others out of their own spiritual ignorance. It's, it's I think, very much like the Bodhisattva ideal in Mahayana Buddhism. You choose not to have Nirvana in order to come back and help others to achieve the state of Nirvana. <laughs> This should remind us of an, in, an important incident in Swami Vivekananda's young life. In Kashipur, a few months before Sri Ramakrishna's passing, Swami Vivekananda tells Sri Ramakrishna, I want nothing more to be than to be immersed in the state of Nirvikalpa Samadhi. Forget about this world and just take some milk once in a while to keep the body going. And Sri Ramakrishna scolds him severely and says, shame on you. I thought you would be like a great banyan tree giving shade and shelter to thousands. Now I see you only care about your own liberation. Aren't you the one who sings, O Lord, thou art all that exists? What is Sri Ramakrishna saying? Nirvikalpa Samadhi, jnana is nothing for you. You've, you had jnana from your birth. This is a trifling thing. You're destined to be a vigyani and to help others out of their spiritual ignorance. Serve others in a spirit of worship by seeing everyone as God. So Sri Ramakrishna is telling him to be not a, a dry Advaitin in the mold of Shankara's philosophy, but a loving Advaitin. Be a follower of what Aurindam Chakraborty nicely calls, he's a, a very prominent contemporary Indian philosopher, a friend of mine. He calls Sri Ramakrishna's philosophy Prema Advaita. It's a beautiful term, Prema Advaita a non-duality of love, a non-dual philosophy of love or based on love. But where does, this, where does all this leave us, ordinary souls? We have neither jnana nor vigyana. These are all very, they seem like distant goals. How is this relevant to us as spiritual aspirants? I would suggest that as spiritual aspirants, we should try to emulate the vigyani's attitude. We should try to emulate the Vigyani's attitude. Fake it till you make it is a common expression in English. So the word fake has a, a negative connotation, but you lose the rhyme unless you keep it. So 
so fake but minus the negative connotations. Fake it till you make it. That's the essence of this practice. Sri Ramakrishna once is explaining to a group of disciples, devotees, Vaishnava spiritual practices. And one of them is compassion toward living beings. And he's talking about it, and then suddenly he goes into a very high spiritual state of ecstasy. And he says, what, compassion? Who are we to practice compassion? We are worms crawling on the earth. God alone can practice compassion. For us, there is Shiva Jnana Jivish Seva. For us, there is only serving others in a spirit of worship by seeing God in every one of us. What does he mean by seeing God? Obviously, it's not the highest realization for most of us. That's, that's a very far off goal. Try your best right now, this very moment, to emulate the Vigyani's outlook on the world, to try to see, imagine God in the hearts of every one of us and serve them accordingly. That's the spiritual practice, I think. So as Swami Vivekananda, one of the keynotes of his talks in the West, and everywhere actually, in India as well, was practical Vedanta. What did he mean by practical Vedanta? Make non-dual Vedanta practical. How do you make it practical? Exactly through Sri Ramakrishna's practice of Shiva Jnana Jiva Seva. Naren, the young Swami Vivekananda, he was in the room when, Swami Vivekananda, when Sri Ramakrishna taught this teaching, Shiva Jnana Jiva Seva, and he was so overwhelmed by it that afterward he took his friends aside and said, this is the most important teaching. And that shaped the rest of his life. Practical Vedanta. I have uh, an academic article on this called Shiva Jnana Jiva Seva, re-examining Swami Vivekananda's practical Vedanta in the light of Sri Ramakrishna, where I argue that Swami Vivekananda's practical Vedanta is just another term, the English equivalent of what Sri Ramakrishna calls Shiva Jnana Jiva Seva. And that the only way to ground this practical Vedanta is on the basis of Sri Ramakrishna's non-dual philosophy of love, Vigyana Vedanta, and not on the basis of Shankara's Advaita Vedanta. How do we know this? In one of his practical Vedanta lectures, Swami Vivekananda says, when he's talking about the nature of the ultimate reality, he says, the impersonal God is a living God, a principle. The difference between personal and impersonal is this, that the personal is only a man. And the impersonal idea is that he is the angel, the man, the animal, and yet something more which we cannot see. Because impersonality includes all personalities, is the sum total of everything in the universe, and infinitely more besides. It's a very unique definition of impersonality. According to Shankara, impersonality, nirgunatva, excludes all personalities. It excludes everything. That's why Brahma Satyam Jagat Mithya. Everything else is, is unreal. For Swami Vivekananda, impersonality includes all personalities. This is why Sri Ramakrishna, when he would explain his own philosophy, he would refer to it as Shab Juriya Ekti. In Bengali, that means it's an all encompassing oneness. It's a oneness that doesn't exclude anything, it's a oneness that includes everything. Another term for this that I, that I like is integral Advaita. It's an integral non duality. It doesn't deny the reality of anything. It accepts the reality of everything as a real manifestation of the one non-dual divine, which is Brahma Shakti, both impersonal and personal. And it's on the basis of this metaphysics of Vigyana Vedanta, of Prema Advaita, of Integral Advaita, that Swami Vivekananda teaches Shiva Jnana Jiva Seva. This is also from his, the same lecture, Practical Vedanta. He says, what is more practical than worshiping here Worshipping you. I see you, feel you, and I know you are God. The Mohammedan says there is no God but Allah. The Vedanta says there is nothing that is not God. The living God is within you, and yet you are building churches and temples and believing all sorts of imaginary nonsense. The only God to worship is the human soul in the human body. He couldn't be more emphatic that one of the highest spiritual practices is to worship God in the form of human beings by serving them. 
exactly what Sri Ramakrishna used to teach. So far I've talked about Sri Ramakrishna's views on love, Swami Vivekananda's views on love. What about Holy Mother? I started this talk with a, a beautiful verse in a hymn composed by Swami Abhedananda for Holy Mother Sharada Devi. What did Holy Mother have to say about love? And sometimes people misunderstand her views on love by cherry picking or taking certain teachings of hers out of context. One of her teachings, well-known teachings on love is Bhalo ek bhagavan chara ar kauke bishuna. Bhalo ek bhagavan chara ar kauke bishuna. Don't love anyone other than God. You might think this is highly uncharacteristic of mother who loves everyone. She's a loving mother to all. This is worse than Shankara in a way. <laughs> That's a serious misunderstanding. You have to take this teaching on love with a more famous teaching of hers on love, which she gave just five days before she left her physical body. I'll read the Bangla first and then explain it. Judi shanti chao ma karo dosh dekhona. Dosh dek be nijer. Jogot ke apnar kore nite shekho. Keo por noe ma jogot tomar. If you want peace, dear, don't see the faults in others. Rather, see your own faults. Learn to see the world as your own. No one is a stranger to you. Literally, the Bangla here is porno. Kyo pornoi. means nobody is other to you, different from you. The world is yours. So often people take this teaching to just mean something that many spiritual teachers teach, which is focus on your own faults, don't focus on other people's faults, and that's true. But there's a much deeper spiritual and philosophical basis behind the teaching. She's justifying that practice of forgiving others and not looking at others' faults and looking at your own faults on the basis of Sri Ramakrishna's Vigyana Vedanta. Jogottumad, we are all the same God in different forms. That's the basis. She's grounding this practice of love toward everyone on the basis of recognizing that there's nothing but God in all of these different names and forms that we're seeing. Every human being, every being, every living being, being is a manifestation of the same Divine Mother. And this was on the basis of her own direct spiritual realization. She says, there's one place I found this. It's very unusual that she would talk about her own spiritual experiences, so these are rare. But she says this. I saw one day, there's nothing but Sri Ramakrishna, Thakur, everywhere in this world. Everywhere I look, I see nothing but Sri Ramakrishna. Kanao Thakur, Khorao Thakur, Thakur Chara Akyone. The blind people I'm seeing, nothing but Sri Ramakrishna. The lame people I'm seeing, nothing but Sri Ramakrishna. This entire world, I realized, is nothing but Sri Ramakrishna. It's not human beings, jivas, that are experiencing suffering. It's Sri Ramakrishna experiencing suffering through every one of these forms. That's why Whenever somebody comes to me with tears in their eyes and with an open and sincere heart, I can't help but help them. Tari jinishe takei kori. It's beautiful, this last statement. Tari jinishe takei kori means by serving others, I'm actually serving Sri Ramakrishna because I see them as Sri Ramakrishna. Sri Ramakrishna himself is coming in the form of these poor suffering souls with tears in their eyes. How can I not but help them? This is the same mother who says, don't love anyone other than God. How is that possible? <laughs> and in her own life, you see how on a daily basis, she was nothing but love personified. How do we reconcile these two things? So let's go back to that original teaching. Bhagavan chara ar kauke bishuna. Don't love anyone other than God. The idea is, if we take both of these teachings together, that's what's important. If you try to love others without seeing God in them, your so-called love for them is just mixed with 
selfish attachment. It's not a pure love. It can never be a pure love. And if you love God, you'll automatically love others because you'll see that there's nothing but God. All these human beings are nothing but manifestations of God. So by loving God, you automatically love others. You have to love everyone as God. That's the practice. Jesus, I think, taught something very similar. He said, love thy neighbor as thyself. A very well-known teaching of Jesus's. But I think it helps to appreciate the depth of this teaching by assuming the perspective of Vedanta here. Knowing that the same divine is present in each one of us, you should love thy neighbor as thyself. Exactly what Holy Mother says, nobody is an other, nobody is different from you. We're all the same divine manifesting in different forms. And so the spiritual practice is to try to emulate this attitude of Holy Mother of these great Vigyanis who love others completely unselfishly without any expectations because they directly see God in every human being. Another important feature of non-dual love is that it's both the highest means and the highest end in spiritual life. It's a very powerful spiritual practice, which I've already talked about, in the form of Shiva Gyane Jive Seva, serving others in a spirit of worship by trying to see God in everyone. But it's also the highest goal, the highest goal. Most of you are thinking, well, I thought the highest goal in Hinduism is mukti, liberation, moksha. It is in most traditions, <clears throat> but there are some bhakti traditions, some devotional traditions, which say that there's a goal higher even than liberation. The Gaudiya Vaishnava tradition actually posits a panchama purushartha. There are usually, traditionally, four purusharthas, four values, fundamental values in Hinduism. Dharma, Atta, Kama, Moksha. Uh, right living, ethical living, is dharma. Artha means acquisition of material wealth. Kama, fulfillment of legitimate worldly desires. And finally, moksha, fourth and highest, is supposed to be liberation. Gaudiya Vaishnavas say, no, there's a fifth purushartha, a fifth human value, which is higher even than liberation. It's supreme love of God. This is that non-dual love. Even higher than liberation. Does that mean that you won't get liberation if you get non-dual love? No, of course you get liberation. It's what Gaudiya Vaishnavas call a tuchafala. It's an incidental byproduct of attaining this highest goal of non-dual love. You'll get it automatically. But the aim, the focus should always be on cultivating this non-dual love. Sri Ramakrishna was fond of singing a song. In the Bangla, the line is, Mukti dite kator noi, shuddha bukti dite kator hoi. Divine Mother is saying, I'm happy to give liberation to people, but when it comes to giving pure love for me, I hesitate. Again, implying that it's a much higher ideal, spiritual ideal, even than liberation. Why is this ideal of non-dual love such a high spiritual attainment? It's another question that might be raised. From a Vedantic standpoint, the idea is that we cannot truly love another human being so long as we identify with the body-mind complex. So we can't feel true love, true bhakti, until we have broken our identification with this physical body and even with the mind. What's the idea? The idea is that all worldly love is grounded in ego, and that ego is bound up with the body-mind complex. So, so long as we're identified with the body-mind complex, we can't love, no matter how much we talk about love, no matter how glib we are about love. We can't truly love in the deepest, highest sense. Spiritual love, by contrast, is grounded in the soul. Each one of us is a divine soul struggling to manifest itself and to express that innate love for God that it always feels. On one occasion, somebody asked Swami Vivekananda, how can one attain bhakti? And he gives a wonderful answer. He says, there is already bhakti within you, only a veil of kama kanchana, lust and wealth, covers it. And as soon as that is removed, bhakti will manifest by itself. Each one of us is already a bhakta in our souls. Our souls are already bhaktas. 
We suffer because we don't identify with the soul within. We identify with the more superficial trappings of the human personality, the psychophysical complex, the physical body, the mind. So the first step in attaining non-dual love, the first step is jnana yoga. And you might be surprised. Jnana yoga is, it contradicts bhakti yoga. That's supposed to be the highest path according to Shankara. It's only after you finish off with bhakti yoga that you practice jnana yoga. No, that's Shankara's schema. But there are others. Ramanuja, the great founder of the Vishishtadvaita school of philosophy. It's a devotional tradition, devotion toward Vishnu, the personal God. He also fully accepts the importance of jnana yoga, the path of knowledge, but in a different sense from Shankara's. And he says it's indispensable in spiritual life, the practice of jnana yoga. He says we should practice karma yoga, the path of selfless action, combine it also with jnana yoga, the path of knowledge, which he defines as meditating on your true nature as an eternal individual soul, which is a child of God, a child of the divine, a spark of the divine fire. Until you realize that you are that divine soul separate from the body-mind complex. And we do it through a combination of, as I said, karma yoga, selfless action, serving others. We do it through all the, what Sri Ramakrishna calls vaidhi bhakti practices. All the different devotional practices encouraged in the scriptures. Worship, arati, attending spiritual discourses, prayer, japa, all these things. But ultimately the goal of all this and jnana yoga, meditating on your true nature as an eternal individual soul. With the aim of, what is the goal of jnana yoga according to Ramanuja? The direct spiritual realization of your true nature as an eternal individual soul, a jivatma, separate from the body-mind complex. That's what Ramanuja calls atma avalokanam direct realization of your true nature as the jivatma, eternal soul separate from the body-mind complex. Sri Ramakrishna, interestingly, oh, then Ramanuja says, after you attain that goal of jnana yoga, then alone are you eligible to practice bhakti yoga in the highest sense. What is that? What is bhakti yoga in the highest sense? Ramanuja says, bhakti yoga is true bhakti yoga, the highest bhakti yoga. It's constantly thinking of God without interruption like an unbroken flow of oil when you pour a canister of oil from one can to another without interruption. How many of us can dare to say that we can do that? We're always interrupted by worldly thoughts and this, suddenly I start thinking about my breakfast or this or that. That's the problem with most of us. We need jnana yoga and karma yoga and ultimately we have to realize our true nature as eternal divine souls to truly practice bhakti, constantly thinking of God and God alone. Sri Ramakrishna says exactly the same thing in fact. He says that the first significant spiritual realization in spiritual life is when the mind ascends to the heart chakra, the, the level of the heart. And he explains this really interestingly. He says, at that point, when the mind reaches the heart chakra, the spiritual aspirant realizes, he says, in wonder, in amazement, eki, eki, what is this, what is this? And then he has a realization of the jivatma in the form of a flame. He uses this language exactly. Jivatma shikarne doshun hai, ad jyoti doshun hai. And he realizes a divine light within him or her. So you have to realize yourself as the jivatman, the eternal divine soul separate from the body-mind complex in order to attain the higher reaches of bhakti. Because he says the direct realization of the personal God is between the eyebrows. And realization of non-dual Brahman is Sahasrara Chakra, the thousand petal lotus. But the first meaningful spiritual realization happens at the heart level by realizing yourself as an eternal soul separate from the body-mind complex. So always keep this in mind. There's a jnana element, a knowledge element built into genuine bhakti practice. It's not all about prayer and worship and japa and all that. Another very, very important facet of devotional practice is to try as much as possible to see yourself as an eternal individual soul, as a soul separate from the body-mind complex, and to look at every human being you interact with as souls struggling to manifest themselves. Another question, Let's say that we attain the highest goal, which is non-dual love. What happens after we leave the physical body? 
What does post, the post-mortem state of liberation look like? And Sri Ramakrishna will give, in his own inimitable way, a beautiful metaphor for this. He says, there are two basic paradigms of liberation. One is eating sugar. The other is becoming sugar. And he says, both are equally valuable. Take your pick. And bhaktas, of course, typically, he says, bhaktas don't want to become sugar. They want to eat sugar. And there's no hierarchy. If they want to eat sugar, let them eat sugar. Advaita Vedanta's followers of Shankara tend to say that that's a lower ideal. It's not the highest goal. Sri Ramakrishna emphatically rejects that. And he says, in fact, it cannot be said bhaktas need nirvana. You don't need to become sugar. There is a state in which the eternal Krishna is with his eternal bhaktas. Nitto Krishna ta nitto bhakto. Krishna is consciousness embodied, and his abode also is consciousness embodied. Chinmoy sham, chinmoy dham. That means that this ideal of dwelling in an eternal heaven with the personal God in the form that you love and lovingly worshiping and serving that God is the highest goal for most bhaktas. That doesn't have to be ultimately left behind to attain some, some kind of higher non-dual truth of becoming sugar. Both are equally valuable. And you might ask, well, but doesn't eating sugar Worshipping God in this eternal heaven, no matter how exalted that is, doesn't that imply duality? Doesn't it imply duality? So then how is Sri Ramakrishna's philosophy non-dual? I keep talking about it as prema advaita, a non-dual philosophy of love. How is it, how is it non-dual? Sri Ramakrishna says, this is a direct quote from the gospel, the whole thing is to love God and taste his sweetness. As a devotee cannot live without God, so also God cannot live without his devotee. Then the devotee becomes the sweetness and God its enjoyer. The devotee becomes the lotus and God the bee. Now, note the next statements. It is the Godhead that has become these two in order to enjoy its own bliss. That is the significance of the episode of Radha and Krishna. What Sri Ramakrishna is saying is, God herself, Divine Mother herself, has become everybody, including her own bhaktas. So when a bhakta is joyfully eating sugar in the form of worshipping Divine Mother, it's Divine Mother herself in the form of bhaktas worshipping Divine Mother. It's Mother worshipping herself. That's what makes it non-dual. Even bhaktas are nothing but different manifestations of the Divine Mother. So, what are some of the key takeaways of this entire talk? How is it really helpful in our spiritual life? First of all, something I've been emphasizing again and again. Practice, try to practice non-dual love in your daily life by following Sri Ramakrishna's teaching, Shiva Gyane Jiva Seva, serving others in a spirit of worship by trying to see God in everyone. And it's not easy, especially when somebody says something nasty to you or you have a difficult relationship with that person. That's the practice. That's why spiritual practice is not, it's not meant to be easy, but the rewards are great. Second, analyze every one of your relationships with other people and with God, with other human beings, with your pets, with God. To what extent is my love for that person mixed up with ego, selfishness, attachment, partiality? These are tough questions to ask, but each one of us as a spiritual aspirant has to ask these questions. What Swami Vivekananda hated more than anything else was hypocrisy. In uh, one of my favorite letters, he says, I hate this world, this dream, this horrible nightmare, with its churches and chicaneries, its books and blackguardisms, its fair faces and false hearts, and above all, its sanctified shopkeeping. Hypocrisy, that's what he hated most. It's one thing to acknowledge your own weaknesses and say, I'm struggling, I'm, I'm, I'm working on this. I'm a work in progress. I haven't yet attained true love, but I'm, I'm not gonna cover dung with roses by calling this love, which is not. Be honest with yourself. But if you're not honest, and you go around talking big about love and unselfishness, and it's nothing but rank egoism and lust and selfishness, that's what Swami Vivekananda hated. That's sanctified shopkeeping. The, mother, or the, the parents talk about loving their kids. I love you. But the parents expect something from their children, or trying to mold them in their own image. 
Same thing with respect to romantic relationships. Whenever there's some expectation of return, that love is tainted. It's no longer love. Lust is the death of love. Selfish attachment is the death of love. So we need to be really brutally honest with ourselves and ask ourselves. We have to be very careful about this. Monitor to what extent egoism, selfishness, attachment creeps into our human relationships. Third, as I already said, another thing is, how do we know we're making progress in spiritual life? The most important measure is, is our heart expanding? Because some people I've seen, they get too caught up in how many hours I'm doing japa or how many rounds of my necklace, the, the, the rosary beads, of how many times do I take God's name. They even have, sometimes people have these electronic counters and you do this, and you can, it, give, it gives you a digital readout of how many times you've repeated the mantra. And I'm not saying you shouldn't do it, but all of that is a means to the end of expanding your heart. That's the important thing. Never lose sight of the fact that the aim here is to become less selfish, less egoistic, and more loving in a genuine way. Fourth practical tip, listen to music. Not all music is the same. Listen to spiritual music, devotional music, or sing, and or sing devotional music. Be careful about ego when you're singing, because there's always a danger. The moment you sing in front of other people is people will start praising you and say, oh, you have such a beautiful voice. And they, oh, stop. <laughs> Again, ego creeps in. So that's why, I, I mean, in a way, it's like safer to listen to music in the privacy of your own room or, you know. But it's a wonderful way to practice what, one of the uh, beautiful statements in the Gita is, mano ridhi nirudhyacha. What's essential in spiritual life is to stop the mind, this chattering, endlessly chattering mind in the heart. And by listening to a, a beautiful piece of spiritual music, a sublime piece of music, automatically that happens. You don't have to try. It's effortless if you listen with concentration. Every one of you, I'm sure, knows this. So it's a wonderful spiritual practice. That's why on every page of the gospel, Sri Ramakrishna is going into ecstasy and samadhi when listening to these beautiful bhajans, these beautiful spiritual songs. Fifth tip, it's about forgiveness. Every spiritual tradition teaches the need to forgive others, right? Prema Advaita, Sri Ramakrishna's Vigyana Vedanta, his non-dual philosophy of love, it gives us a spiritual basis for genuine forgiveness. We all know there's a cliche at this point, to err is human, to forgive is divine, right? Does anyone know who said this? It's taken from Alexander Pope's essay in an, an essay on criticism, a great Renaissance writer. And he was right on the nose. Making mistakes is human. Every one of us has made mistakes and will continue to make mistakes. Forgiving others for their mistakes is divine, genuinely divine. Why is it divine? Because each one of us is the same divinity, the same divine, and the only difference between you and me is a difference in the, de in the degree to which we are able to manifest that divinity within us. That's the only difference. So when somebody wrongs us, true forgiveness of that person means I'm seeing them as struggling souls, divine souls struggling to manifest her own divinity. And when I make a mistake, we should be equally forgiving toward ourselves, but without slackening our spiritual practice and say, I'm also a divine soul doing my best, struggling to manifest that divine within, and to give yourself a break as well. So I wanted to end this talk by quoting from my favorite poem of Swami Vivekananda's. I'm going to say something a little bit controversial, which you can feel free to disagree with. But Swami Vivekananda has composed many poems, many in English, some in Sanskrit, some in Bengali. But by far, my favorite ones of his are all in Bengali. It was his mother tongue. And his English poems just don't land for me in the same way that his Bengali ones do. And among all of the Bengali poems, my favorite is Shokar Prati, To a Friend. And I wanted to read to you two stanzas from this poem. I'll, I'll read my translation, and then uh, I'll give you the original Bengali of just the last stanza. Listen. I will speak to you from my heart. I have discovered the true essence of life. There is only one ferry that can take us across the terrible ocean of samsara, buffeting us with its waves. 
mantras and rituals, control of breath, disputation, philosophy, science, renunciation, enjoyment. All are mere delusions of the mind. Love, love, this is the sole treasure. From Brahman down to the worm and atom, in all things, the same God of love dwells. Friend, offer mind, life, and body at their feet. These are God's various forms right in front of you. Rejecting them, where are you looking for God? One who loves all beings truly serves God. One who loves all beings truly serves God. And I'll just read the, the final stanza in Bangla. Brahmo hote kit poromanu, shorbo bhute shei premamoy, mon pran shori rotpun koro shokhe, e shobar pai. Bohurupe sham muke tomar, chari kota kujijo ishor, jibe prem kore jay john, shei john, shebeche ishor. This last stanza, and it's so powerful in the original Bangla, the, the rhyme scheme, every word, the way, every choice of word. This last stanza in four lines packs in the entire talk I've just given on non-dual love, explaining how non-dual love is the highest attainment, the highest truth, and it's the highest spiritual practice. He says, everything in this world is nothing but the God of love. Everything is God, and what is God? God is nothing but love. Prema moi is the Bengali. God is the essence of prema. I'll let the phone ring or stop. Okay. Oh, still going. <laughs> we'll just pause a second here. Okay. No problem. Okay. And then Swami Vivekananda says, everything in this world is the God of love. Last two lines. That God of love dwells in every one of us. So why are you going elsewhere to find God? Find God, discover God in each one of these souls by serving them. That person who truly loves other people by serving them. That person alone truly loves God. And so we can think of this as a yoga of love. There's jnana yoga, bhakti yoga, the yoga of love. It's a form of bhakti yoga. The highest spiritual practice, this yoga of love, is to love others by serving them. And it has two steps. He lays them out in the last stanza. First, surrender to the divine who is present in everyone as love. So you're able to surrender. If you really have surrendered to God, you should surrender to the people around you, seeing them as God and serving them accordingly. And second, try to love all and serve all as manifestations of the divine. These are God's various forms right in front of you, he says. Rejecting them, where are you looking for God? One who loves all beings truly serves God. Thank you. <laughs>